close your eyes. Close your eyes. And then when, just picture whatever images, whatever words come to mind. When I say North Korea, press <laughs> 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 close. And now, magic bestowed upon me by Albert Gallatin himself. I'm going to draw those images straight from your mind and put them on the screen. Was this your car? I'm imagining it was so because these are the sorts of images that proliferate in the American media surrounding North Korea. And these are also some phrases that might have come to your mind, such as hermit kingdom, most isolated country in the world, brainwashed dystopia. And I just pulled these all straight from New York Times articles. None of this is anything that I came up with. And then while these words and images may not affect you on a daily basis, I'm imagining you probably never think about this, they were somewhere inside there. And today I want to talk to you about how the way we represent, visualize, and describe North Korea is seriously problematic and even extremely urgent. So to ground this conversation, I want to start by orienting us around a particular artifact I'm guessing you might all be familiar with, which is the interview. <laughs> so the interview came out about a year or two, about a couple years ago, uh, written by Seth Rogen, James Franco. And the plot is something like Kim Jong-un invites an interviewer to come to North Korea to interview him because he loves his interview show. And the CIA has this interviewer try to assassinate him. So I want to use this film to start to parse how the ways that North Korea is represented within this particular movie comes from the broader tradition of Orientalism, and a particular brand of Orientalism that is applied to North Korea. So the first thematic would be demonization. In the very opening scene, a little girl sings a beautiful song about how she hopes that all Americans will drown in their own blood and feces, die Americans die, it would warm my tiny heart, and then a missile shoots out of the statue behind her. <laughs> now, this may seem kind of silly, but it creates an image of North Koreans as warmongering, American-hating monsters, which gets translated into the images <coughs> of nuclear missiles and uh, military parades and such. Secondly, there's a theme of dehumanization. When Dave Scarlett arrives in Pyongyang, he gives a nice warming speech about how even though North Koreans and Americans have different faces and speak different languages, they're the same. They are same, same, but deeper in. And this is a horribly racist thing that he says, and even Seth Rogen kind of groans in the background. But the way that this gets translated into a dehumanizing way that we picture North Koreans is the best, especially how we see them as robotic, automatons, lifeless, soulless machines for the state. And even young children, seen in such videos as this that went viral, are seen as embodying this robot, lifeless personality. And then finally, we have infantilization, which is an extremely common thematic in Orientalism. At the very end, when David Schuyler finally interviews Kim Jong-un, he provokes him into crying by seeing Katy Perry's firework, which is some sort of running joke in the film, at which Kim Jong-un starts to scream and cry, I don't need my father, I am strong, revealing his daddy issues. And this gets translated into how we see North Korea as being infantile, unable to take care of itself, unable to be trusted with serious issues. And this cover in The New Yorker from a couple Januarys ago didn't even have any entire content. This was just a cover. And while these may seem like sort of the brash humor of Franco and Rogan, these sorts of themes seep insidiously into lots of other media artifacts, including this real-life news headline, memes, and even tumblers, which get turned into $40 coffee table books. You can buy on Amazon if you wish. Now, in recent times, past couple of years, there has been a new movement to move past these sorts of images, which are mostly proliferated, proliferated by the media, into understanding what is going on in North Korea really. What is everyday North Korea really like? And photographs and documentaries have especially been a part of this as photographs seem to have this sort of indexical quality that delivers to us real life. But I argue that even these sorts of images are operating within the same mechanisms that I just discussed of trying to probe forbidden images and rare glimpses out of North Korea and really just giving us what we think we already know and want to see, not what is actually objectively offered. So this is an image by architectural journalist Oliver Wainwright who came up with a series of photographs called North Korean interiors. And while this may seem like a very sterile, objective, devoid of humanity study of a locker room, I argue that it fulfills for us a kind of pornographic desire, which comes from this idea that Linda Williams, a critical theorist, calls maximum visibility. This image gives us maximal visibility of a place that we believe wants to hide from us. 
and through this forced confession, you begin a sort of pleasure. And so this sort of blank canvas, because it is devoid of people, exactly because it's devoid of people, operates as sort of pornographic desire because we get to project our own Orwellian fantasies onto the country through an image like this. <clears throat> and now, Sally Markowitz, a philosopher that studies at Willamette University, describes the sort of response that we might be having to especially images of suffering or even defector memoirs, which are supposed to promise to us a true insight into the voices of North Koreans and a way to empathize or sympathize with their experience as the aesthetic meta response. Because we can have a couple of responses to art. We can have a moral response where we recognize that the content is difficult or problematic. But we can also have an aesthetic response where we understand that it has artistic merit. But she describes this concept of the aesthetic meta response where we feel good about the fact that we felt bad. And so as she says, when a moral reaction becomes autonomous, there really ceases to be anything morally exemplary about it. And this really upsets and disturbs me, especially when applied to North Korea, because as the United Nations Human Rights Council reported back in 2014, the state, uh, the state of things going on in North Korea today, the gravity and scale of those human rights violations, reveals a state that was unparalleled in the contemporary world, at least as in 2014. And so when we talk about North Korea represented, visualized in this way, by demonizing, dehumanizing, and infantilizing it, we obscure very serious problems going on there and destroy our ability to do anything effective about them or even just take them seriously. So I think moving forward, what's extremely important is that we begin to historicize North Korea because the way that we represent it is ahistoricized. And by planting our representations back into history, we can begin to see where they came out of a natural historical progression, one that the United States was actually extremely complicit in. So I want to give you a brief 100-year history of the Korean Peninsula, which might be one of the most volatile in the past 100 years of any region. So from 1910 to 1945, the Korean Peninsula was under Japanese occupation, Japanese colonialism, which included such protocols as the eradication of Korean culture. And when Japan was defeated at the end of World War II, the Korean Peninsula was divided into the North and the South by the Soviet Union and the United States, who took over those two territories, respectively. And in 1950, the Korean War broke out, which the United States entered in the name of the first war fought in the containment of communism, and decided to utilize the newly formed United Nations military troops. So interestingly, more than one, in fact, dozens of different nations were represented in that military. And at when the Korean War ended in 1953, the South went through a series of military dictatorships, coups, and recently a new sort of industrialization. While in the North, there was a serious economic collapse and famine, as I'm sure you've heard, in 1991, when the Soviet Union fell apart. And so when we talk about and think about the Korean Peninsula, especially North Korea, it's really important to understand that the way that North Korea has conceptualized itself as a nation, as a body, has been born extremely out of this colonial experience that has been defined by anti-colonial resistance. And so when you first begin to deep, dig, dig deeper into North Korea, you'll notice the word juche comes up, which is a central philosophy or ideology to North Korea, and is translated roughly into self-reliance, although it parses more into self and body, this idea of autonomous body. And while we may have this concept in America that is impossible to learn anything about North Korea, that we just don't know what's going on in there, and that they're hiding behind some sort of iron curtain, this opaque facade that they don't want to be penetrated, North Korea has a very intense desire to be understood and recognized on the global stage as a true player, as a legitimate nation, and also to be seen in this way, if only in a particular way. And the image behind me depicts the Arirang Mass Games, which uh, is a massive gymnastic performance you might be familiar with, and actually used to be a mandatory stop on all tours of North Korea for foreigners, because it is one of the primary ways that North Korea represents itself to the outside world. And so I believe that if we begin to look at, if we begin to historicize North Korea and look at where its values and ideologies come from, we can begin to parse images that we've been receiving in a new way with more room for understanding of them, such as this image of a crowd crying at Kim Jong-il's funeral. And while usually the discussion around an image like this is something like, they're crazy, they're brainwashed, or they're all being forced to do this, I think we can begin to understand 
how this might have more authenticity or a different kind of authenticity than we might be familiar with. An anthropologist, Sonia Rahm, calls this concept sovereign love. She identifies that the sovereign, which was Kim Il-sung primarily, first leader of North Korea, has a sort of relationship with his people constituted by historically constituted political kinship. Because Kim Il-sung was the leader to take them out of the colonial um, colonization, and in that way he created a sort of family that he was a leader of, and in fact did even adopt a lot of refugee children from that conflict. And going forward, the idea that the historically constituted body became more important than the blood ties. So while many may seem think that the Kim regime is some sort of nepotism, actually Kim, Il, uh, Kim Jong Il was appointed and fed into this new fed into the legend through the idea that he was more historically close to this resistance and that he was the best representative of the historically constituted political kinship. And in this way, Sonia Rong talks about how there are two kinds of life political and biological, and the political becomes the more prominent form of life in North Korea. And so while we may think it's still sort of impossible or crazy to understand how a group of people respond to this funeral as if it was their own loved one, if you root these sorts of images and ideas in the colonial experience, and then the years of time that happened after that, we can begin to understand why that may have something to them that is important and that we don't need to be able to grasp or define. So moving forward, I think we need to begin making more representations of North Korea that historicize and humanize the country. And the first example I want to offer to you is a documentary film that came out last year called Under the Sun. And now while the content of Under the Sun is not super unique for a documentary about North Korea, it follows an 11-year-old named Zinmi as she joins the Children's Brigade over the course of about a year, it actually is edited in a very, very unique way, which is the thing I want to talk about today. Because the director, Vitaly Mansky, left his cameras rolling 100% of the time. And while usually an editor would trim the ragged edges of any scene, he keeps all of the edges in. And so we see how every, every scene was actually constructed, being that he was given a North Korean director and a script for his own film. And so Under the Sun begins to exist in some sort of bizarre space that is between the American representation of North Korea that tries to pry its own version of truth out of the out of the nation, and North Korea's own self-representation, which must be acknowledged as being dangerously hyperbolic. And so I like this film because it exists in this sort of nebulous, ambiguous space between what we've been offered so far, and opens up a new kind of space where we can begin making new representations. As well, Under the Sun is very important because it gives us what Shinny Choi calls the return gates. In a lot of artifacts about North Korea, North Korean people are reduced to lifeless, inanimate objects, often viewed from afar as, as small as ants, because directors are forced, or think they're forced, to be left only with the forbidden gaze or the very glimpse through the, the window curtain or something like that. But because Vitaly Mansky was working in such constructed artificial conditions, he was able to capitalize on the art of cinematography to give more of a face to the North Korean people he was filming. And so in several moments of the film, you see North Koreans confronting the camera very strongly, their face filling the entire film. And so instead of us just getting to gaze at them and make our own assessments of what their lives would be like, they confront us and show us that they are their own people. Now, when we talk about representation, I think it's extremely important to ask, whose right is it to make these representations at all? As a scholar, as an American, is it even my privilege to get to decide what a productive representation even means? And so moving forward, I think it's extremely important that North Korean voices, which are unmediated by documentarians or memoirists, come to the foreground. And so on the left here, we have a painting from defector Sun Moon, who used to be a propaganda artist for the state, but now uses his propaganda style as a sort of accidental pop art to comment on his very ambiguous and ambivalent relationship to a country that he both intensely loved, but has a lot of pain towards. And on the right here, we have a cover of a book that was just uh, released in the United States last month, which is a collection of short stories from an author working within North Korea about his experiences of what he feels life is like there. And so when we receive stories like this, which are first-person accounts of North Korea, I believe we get the opportunity to be touched by these experiences and to understand them in a way that is not demanded by our own understanding of what we think they are. Now to end, 
I want to give you this video here, and I bet you're about to recognize the song that's going to play. But I think it's actually not as silly as you might think, and it's an extremely productive representation of North Korea. Because, if nothing else, here we have a collaborative effort that surrounds the joy of music. And the artist that created this video, Martin Travitt, stages artistic interventions around the world, and has done this a lot in North Korea already, through a methodology that he calls hyper-theater. Because he believes that everyday life is an act of performance, an act of role playing, and a serious um, ways that we can interact with it through art. Because art privileges the playful, the inquisitive, over the ways that commercials, propaganda, news media, academia does. And so he gave a CD of a Hans Hunting High and Low to this group, and two days later they handed him back this. And while I think that maybe something like that kind of feeds into the idea that North Korea is full of robots who do things with, in ways that we don't understand, if you look at this in another way, you can see that, as Milton Travis said, here North Korea has fun. It gives them a sort of personality and something that we can connect with them with. Your mutual with a song, of music, of an experience that we all can share. So I've been thinking about North Korea for the past four years, and while it is, uh, while it may have been sort of my moral obsession, it is beyond that because it's becoming actually in the present day extremely urgent to think about how we're representing North Korea right now. Because in the past couple days. Trump sent an aircraft carrier to the Korean Peninsula in the name of global peacekeeping. And where dehumanization, demonization, and infantilization get directly translated into an image of North Korea that is despotic, evil, and totally incapable of being predicted, we get justification for military action. And in a reality where these are the only sorts of images that we do have surrounding North Korea, this kind of military action, or even possibly war, might not be prevented or protested as being unwarranted or dangerous, but might possibly just be accepted as presidential. Thank you. <laughs>